Could that be a problem? First John chapter 5, verse, let's go to verse 14. It says, that, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Notice that. He says, if we ask anything according to the will, according to his will, he hears us. That means that his will is his language. His will is his language. He says, if I ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That means if I'm not praying according to the will of God, he doesn't hear me. That's what he's saying here. But you see, we've been erroneously taught that God hears every prayer. So if somebody's praying, God, kill my enemies, God will not hear that person. Because the Bible says clearly, it's not God's will that any man should die, should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If I'm not praying according to the word of God, which is the will of God, God doesn't hear me. That's what, the, what we just saw here now. If you don't pray according to his will, he doesn't hear you. So God is not moved in prayer. God is not moved by our passion. See, that's something that people have said before. Oh, if you cry, God will answer you when you cry. He's not moved by our passions. Our crying or lack thereof is not what moves God. It's not what determines whether God is hearing us or not. According to the Bible, also looking at it here, look at it again, look at that verse again. Look at it. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That's First John chapter 5 verse 14. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If I ask according to his word, his will is his word. According to his word, he hears us. More or less, if I'm asking based on the promises that are in the word of God, or based on what the word of God says about me, or about this situation, God hears. Okay? It doesn't stop there. And it says that, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. So there's that first step of what is the will of God? So when I pray according to the will of God, he hears me. And then when I know that he has heard me, I'm confident that it's taken care of. So imagine somebody who is not praying according to the will of God. Who is not praying according to the word of God. Let me give another example. Very practical example. Here's a single man or a single woman who wants to get married. And the person has already made up their mind about who they want to get married to. Okay? And they go to God in prayer and do what I call the rubber stamp prayer. And say, Father God, I, this is this guy, blah, blah, blah. Now, there's some problems with that person because I'm going to assume something now that that individual they are praying about is not a Christian. That individual they are praying about is not a believer. And they are praying to God to bless their relationship and turn into a marriage or their marriage, whatever you want to call it. Okay? The problem, there are a couple of problems with that. First of all, you're asking God to rubber stamp something. And God, when it comes to the will of God, when it comes to what I'll say, the will of God that is not revealed clearly in the scriptures where you have to seek his will you have to wait on the lord you don't rub you don't pray rubber stamp prayers you pray and seek the bible jesus said ask and you shall receive seek and you shall find there's a difference between asking and seeking and knocking difference asking seeking and knocking seeking means you've got to seek for something something is hidden from you you got to seek for it Asking means that thing is you know, in somebody's hand who can give it to you. Seeking means something is either lost or is hidden from you and you got to seek. Okay, So uh, that is what seeking is. Seek, uh, so when I'm, when I, I want to know, I don't know my tomorrow. Neither do you know your tomorrow. I don't know what, you know, what lies ahead of tomorrow. I don't know what's in the next five, ten minutes. There are decisions that, that I have to make, that you have to make that are life altering decisions. And therefore, rather than just jumping into them and doing the rubber stamping type thing, you got to wait on the Lord and seek the will of God. That's where the seeking comes in. Like that individual should have sought God about that relationship before sought God, always seeking God concerning the relationship, you know, about this individual or about relationships in general. And say, Lord, direct me to the person who is best for me, who is in line with your will for me. You know, who is, who is in line with my, with your, with my future. But apart from that, that individual who that, who that person came to God in prayer for earlier on, like I was mentioning, 
He's not a Christian. And therefore, let me say this to you, the Bible is clear about what is called the unequal yoke. The unequal yoke is somebody who is not a Christian. They're not born again. They, in fact, God, let me, let, me give you, let me give you an example of how this thing works. In the Old Testament, God told them, Israelites, not to marry non-Jews. Only marry Jews. Don't marry non-Jews. So also in the New Testament, we are told in the same way not to marry somebody who is not a Christian. It's called the unequal yoke. Because here you are, you are growing. You are desiring to grow in God. You now want to yoke yourself and form an, a, a covenant relationship with somebody who has no covenant relationship with God. That's how dangerous that is. You know, Christianity is a spiritual covenant relationship with God. God is your father. When a person is not born again, I'm sorry to say, God is not their father spiritually. God is their maker, but not their father. Because being born again makes you a child of God. John 1, 12, as many as received them, to them he gave the power to become sons or children of God, or daughters of God. So if a person is not born again, they are not a child of God. Whose child are they? A child of the devil. <laughs> so here you are, a child of God who has covenant with God, forming a relationship, marriage covenant with somebody whose father is the devil. How can that succeed? How can that, how can that, how can it work? You know how it can work? You know how it will end up working? Somebody's got to make a compromise. Somebody's got to compromise. And many times, you are the one who ends up compromising. I'm not, I'm trying to think of people who I've known who were Christians, who married non-Christians. And I've not seen too many that were very successful in winning their husband and their wife to the Lord. It's, 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 what I'm going to say, I don't want to be, I don't want to, it's, I'm not saying as a principle, but it's sometimes easier for a man who is a Christian to win his wife over who is not a Christian. I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's a principle, I'm not saying it's a fact, I'm just saying, because this is my assumption. He's the head of the home, and he can probably use that influence in that sense to influence his wife. It's not necessarily, it's not necessarily true all the time too. <laughs> you know? So imagine a woman who is a Christian now marrying a man who is not a Christian. He becomes the head of your home. And many times, those kind of situations, the man, the woman could tell the man, or the, the man would tell the woman, so I don't want you to go to that church anymore. I don't want you to go to church anymore. You pray too much. You read your Bible all the time. You know, so I, I don't know why anybody who is a Christian will put themselves in that predicament if they don't have to. But sometimes people have already made up their minds, this is the man I want to marry. Okay, that's why I don't want to stay on the subject of the marriage. But that's why it's very, very important. That people do not just marry based on what they see now. What they see now. God knows the future. God knows his plans. The Bible says in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Plans for your welfare, for your well-being. That's why when it comes to the future, we have to seek God to give us wisdom concerning the future. Seek God to help us make right decisions for the future. You know. So I don't want to make that. I don't want to make decisions like that just based on what I see right now. She's she's skinny. She's this. She's that. He's tall. That can handsome. He's, whatever it is, you know. And that becomes a premise on which all you know. She got style. He got swag. That becomes a premise on which I'm I'm getting married to someone who let's say, let's say is not a Christian or is a Christian but it's not serious. So sometimes we, some people have have come to the altar. But they are, they're not taking Christianity very seriously. And you are. It becomes, it, it becomes a conflict. Conflict of interest. So I mean, I'm just using an example. We need to communicate with God based on his language. First point. Prayer is communication. It's a two-way communication. That means I talk to God and God speaks back to me. I talk to God. I receive, I receive his peace. And his peace is a voice. His peace is that inner voice that tells you, I got it. So I might not necessarily hear a voice on the outside saying, everything's in control. No. But on the inside, I hear the voice of God. I hear the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit telling me, it's okay. I got this. Okay. Or sometimes God even actually speaks to me, gives me direction. Let's look at an example. Look at Habakkuk. It's an Old Testament prophet called Habakkuk. Some people say Habakkuk. How about you pronounce it? It's fine. Haba Haba. Hey, Grandma. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Well, while we're finding that, I just want to, like, I guess, co-sign on what you're saying. 
Yeah. I used to date this little Muslim girl, you know, mm-hmm. and I was in love with her, and I was gonna try to make her my wife, you know. But um, I could like I would always think about the problems that would arise, and I didn't. I wasn't hearing like I hear today, yes, way sir. back then, this is way back in college, you know. Mm-hmm. But for whatever reason, there was enough separation between the two of us where we just kind of fell off from one another, you know, because the emotion gets involved. And so you, you want something for you that's not, not the best for you. And like the thing about serving God, the thing about being a human is that he gave us something called free will. Yep. And we can exercise it at any point in time we want to. But what I tell people is if you want to be maximized, mm-hmm. you just have to ask him what he wants for you. Yeah. Kind of get there, you know. You have to do it his way. You can do whatever you want, but you won't be maximized. Yeah. You're absolutely That's correct. Well yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're absolutely on point. Hundred and twenty percent on point. Absolutely on point. If you want your life to maximize, you want to get the best of life. Because I look at it this way. It's, I mean, Stacy. I know what to look at it that way. If you buy a Toyota vehicle, okay, a Toyota vehicle tells you that you need to put supreme gas in your car, and you decide to put regular gas in it. Yes, your car will function, but your engine might knock. Other things will go wrong because I mean because the the, the makers of that vehicle made it to to uh, to use that particular grade of gas, but you choose to put your own gas because say it's my vehicle, it's my car. I paid for it, therefore I choose what I want to do. I'm going to put just regular in my car. Well, yeah, you can do that if you want to, but when the car breaks down or the car is having certain problems, don't blame Toyota. Same thing with same thing with God. And when yeah. it comes to these issues, people make choices that don't work for them. And they want to blame God. They want to, you know, they, they want to look up to God at that time, you know. And sometimes God is trying to spare us, let me say, a very difficult future when He tells us these things. I believe that the the the, the, the commandments of God are not given to us primarily. When I say commandments, I mean the principles of God were not given to us to to uh, to curtail our fun. They are given to protect us, as it were, protect us and help us yeah. maximize, enjoy the earth. I mean, when you look at the dietary laws in the Old Testament, all those dietary laws, if you look at them very closely, they are the same laws that people are talking about today. When you look at people who are talking about diet, all the different diets, the same thing they tell you. You know, low-carb diet, they're all there in the Bible. It tells you to avoid all these things, avoid certain types of food. People love seafood, but it tells you to avoid them. And if you look at people who are into the whole diet, fat, fat, diet industry, they mention the same things that are in the Bible. You know, as things you need to avoid, and things you need to eat more of, eat more vegetables, eat more natural nuts and all that, not processed. It's all there in the scriptures. It's all there. You know, even when it comes to, uh, um, if I'll say, curtailing how much dainties you eat, is there in the Bible also? It speaks about cut, putting, putting a knife to your throat, uh, not not natural, like cutting your throat. But what it simply means is dainties. You know, just consume a little bit of them. It's all there in the scriptures. You know. So, like you're saying, I, I, have to, I agree with you 120%. I agree totally with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I had to come to the realization that I, I was a control freak, you know, with my life. I trusted me. You know, that's who I trusted with faith. Uh, even when people were trying to give me advice, you know, I would disagree with them. I was in, I was in like junior high school or elementary school mm. saying to my teachers, what makes the way you look at it the right way? See, <laughs> I, I trust me. Yeah. And at some I started realizing that I don't know how to maximize me. Yeah. Because yeah. I would I would see as I look back at my life the weight the potential yeah. in this place and in that place. And how if I would have only done it differently, differently. See, I was looking back. What God what the Holy Ghost gives you the ability to do is look forward mm. and see it and say, Oh, I should go this way because that's the way you know, they don't maximize me. And the thing is, you, know, you think you have a plan for your life, but you don't know his plan for your life, which is much greater, much like more overwhelming than any plan you can ever come up with. And since it's not your plan, you yeah. don't know how to get there. You don't know how to execute it. And I guess I'm just venting a little bit. But so then you have to rely on them for every little step along the way because you don't even know where you're going Stacey. at the time. You, you and I, we woke up, you open your eyes one day and find that you're on the earth. 
You don't know how you got here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So if God that brought you here, and you don't know how you got here, is telling you, I have a plan for you, man, the best thing to do is say, hey, I submit to your will. <laughs> I don't know how I got here. Yeah. So I'm going to submit to your will. I'm going to follow your plan, whatever that plan is that you have laid out for me. And the Bible gives us a, a blueprint. So God has given us a blueprint of his plan in his word. Okay, and giving us the Holy Spirit also to be like our GPS. I tell people the Bible is a map, like a road map. The Holy Spirit is your GPS. So what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit interprets that map for you and gives you the turn left, turn right. If you if you make a mistake, your GPS says reverse. <laughs> you make a U-turn. Holy Spirit, the GPS is the Holy Spirit exactly. <laughs> you know, GPS tells you turn right, turn left, go straight. So if you're if you're speeding too much, I mean I had a GPS that was that way, it will tell you you're speeding, slow down. If you get to a place where they say where they say a, 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 a light, um, a camera, the GPS will warn you. Ding 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 ding, there's a camera here. <laughs> That's the Holy Spirit right there. Yeah. You know? And, and, and you know what, Rabbi, what's scary about following, you know, God's leading is that his ways really aren't our ways. Like none of us really have the mind of God. None of us have the mind of God. So then the things that he's asking you to do are going to be difficult at times yeah. for you to want to do. Yeah. It's just true. Yeah. But if you believe the old this no pain, no gain, then you have to believe that it's being uncomfortable that mm -hmm. is teaching you new things. He's trying to get you to think a different way. To yeah. think like him. He's actually trying to to, to transform your mind to being like you. Exactly. But, yeah. uh, You're right. <laughs> You're right. But but again, see, w w one interesting thing though is this. The more you yield to the voice of God, the more you yield to the living of God, guess what? The easier it gets. The easier it gets. Once you, it, it's like, I, I watch, um, I watch this show on TV. 